I work at a test facility for one of the major spacecraft manufacturers. You see the company and its CEO in the news all the time. For obvious reasons, I won't name the company, though I'm sure there are two or three names swimming in your head right now. I'm still putting myself at risk telling you what I know. Yep. Even if I don't name names, I'm still in danger. I just... I just can't keep this to myself any longer. When you think of these facilities, you probably envision engineers, astronauts, and other exceptional people changing the world. You would probably never think of the guys like me, though. A custodian at this facility. And the only reason I am aware of the situation here is because a janitor may as well be invisible to these people. They think the wrappers on the cafeteria floor and the piss on the toilet seats magically disappear. You see, most of the time, I have access to almost the whole facility. Even when a room is off limits to me, I'm working in other rooms close by. Security here is tight for obvious reasons, but the people who built this place didn't make it soundproof. The walls and the glass are thinner than you would expect. The vents are like echo chambers. And if I'm working in a room close by, it's accurate to say that I'm within earshot. Okay, so, a few nights ago, there was an undocumented launch from a top-secret prototype. NASA and the Air Force weren't notified, and the board was completely in the dark. Only the CEO and the project staff were in on the secret, or so they thought. The project was codenamed Whisper. Whisper runs on an alternative fuel source that powers some brand new propulsion system. The thing takes off and lands wherever they want it to, and it does so very quietly. Even the amount of light coming from the engines is negligible. In addition to launching and landing without a commotion, the thing is meant for extended travel. They weren't just thinking of the moon with this one. At one point, I heard the CEO telling the engineers, quote, Mars is just the start. From what little I know about this stuff, that doesn't seem possible at least not for the foreseeable future. Seven people served as Whisper's crew. I don't know if they were all pilots or if they had scientists tasked with specific tests, but I am sure that one of the crew was a relative of the CEO. The night of the launch, I was cleaning up a boardroom close to mission control. I could hear the pre-flight check and countdown through the vents. During a typical launch, it wasn't odd to feel a little tremble in the building. You would hear the ignition of the takeoff. But that night there was no tremble, no ignition blast. Loud applause erupted from mission control, and I assumed that whisper had taken off. As I was wiping coffee rings off of the conference table, I heard whisper's captain tell mission control that they were on their way. More cheering went up, but it was hushed down by the lead in mission control. He asked the captain when they would reach their destination. According to our readouts, we will reach our destination in 36 hours. Over. Uh, affirmative, Captain. I want the first sleep shift to occur at 0400 hours. Affirmative. Over. Affirmative. Mission control. Over and out. I pushed the trash can out into the hallway. As I did, the CEO walked past me into a boardroom. Four or five people followed behind him, all of them smiling. I heard the pop of a champagne bottle as the door closed behind me. I cleaned the boardroom up just in time for them to mess it up again. Inside the big fishbowl that was mission control, most of the people were hugging each other and shaking hands. The remaining few were glued to their monitors, typing away. On the large screen, I saw something that looked like an old water tower. A gentle blue light was at the base of it, surrounded by six more blue lights. I assume this was Whisper's engines. I pushed the large trash can and my cart up the hallway to clean some nearby offices. An alarm rang out as I was emptying a bin in one of the engineer's offices. I dragged my things out into the hall and stood there. The alarm only rang out once, but I could see people at the other end of the hall rushing back into mission control. I quietly walked down the hall to see what was happening. There was no sign of fire or a breach, just people running in to mission control. 
There was a large mass on the big screen that looked like a purple cloud. Mission Control, are you seeing this? Over. In spite of the captain's best efforts, I could hear the concern in his voice. I'm sure Mission Control heard it too. Affirmative, Captain. Uh, we see it. Over. The purple cloud was drifting towards Whisper. It seemed to ripple on its surface. I felt a breeze as the CEO walked past me, heading towards Mission Control. The lead engineer was at his back, and he started to give me a stern look, but then picked up his pace when he heard his boss open the door to Mission Control. As they were climbing the ramp, he was still looking at me. Instead of going back to the office, I headed towards the supply closet, and that would explain my presence in the hall better than the alarm. In the closet, I shuffled through my supplies, searching for the best excuse. I grabbed a few garbage bags and a fresh spray can of all-purpose cleaner. It would be simple enough to tell them that I ran out. When I was heading back, I could hear the captain again. It's almost honest, Mission Control. How should we proceed? How should we proceed? Mission Control. Uh, uh, uh. The large screen cut out. Vital signs displayed on the sides were spiking. Captain. Captain. I walked back to my cart as fast as possible. Then I gathered my things and made my way to the corridor of offices that ran behind the boardroom. Another alarm started to go off, though this one kept going. Someone from Mission Control came on the loudspeaker. Doctors Wilson and Khan report to Mission Control immediately. This is Code Delta. Repeat, this is Code Delta. The Code Delta alarm went on as long as it took me to clean two offices. I was making my way to the center office when I heard the door to the boardroom close. I put my ear against the boardroom's thin back wall. Someone started to speak. Sir, with all due respect, the only thing we can do is bring Whisper back. Remotely, if... The person speaking must have been cut off. It's not out of the ordinary to see the most brilliant people shut up when the CEO put up his hand without a sound. His stop right there motion. The way I see it, we have only two options here, the CEO said. The first option is that we let Whisper go. But sir, we can't do that, we- The other voice stopped again. Another person chimed in. With all due respect, sir, Whisper cost the company $250 million. We can't just sweep that under the rug. We can, and we will, the CEO said in a brisk and confident tone. Whisper was funded via alternative means. There is no mention of the project in our books. There is no manifest, so there's nothing to worry about here. Nothing to worry about here? Sir, we still have someone up there. Ethan. Ethan, the CEO said. No. No, sir. We still have a man up there. People died up there. Your nephew died up there. We have to bring him back. There was a brief pause. Then the CEO said, Let's hear what the good doctor has to say. Ethan, the doctor said, I understand your stance completely. However, we need to factor in every piece of the equation here. The crew didn't die of natural causes up there, after all. They were exposed to an external object. We know nothing about the subject except for the aftermath of the crew's encounter with it. We don't know if this is an organism or some form of radiation, what have you. If we bring the ship and its lone survivor down now, who knows what sort of contamination we would be risking. <laughs> okay, that's just great, Ethan yelled. We're just going to scrap a quarter billion dollar prototype and condemn a man to death then? Not necessarily, the CEO said. But sir, Ethan, do you need to be put on family leave? There was a brief silence. The CEO continued. We won't necessarily scrap a quarter billion dollar project. Ethan, I know how much you and your team have worked on this project. I've made several sacrifices too. A lot of my own time and my own money went into this. Sir, your nephew died in the pursuit of greatness. You should all be so lucky. He touched the stars. The CEO took a brief pause. Our medical staff will determine the risk of contagion. If Whisper and the crew's bodies are not a threat, we will remotely bring Whisper home for a safe landing. 
no one will be the wiser. If, however, the threat of contamination is too great, we will remotely pilot Whisper to the dark side of the moon and let it drift out into space. Just another piece of space junk. If that's the case, we can always build another prototype, and there will be others, willing to achieve greatness, desperate to serve as her crew. And the captain? A new voice asked. There was a brief pause. <sighs> the captain has died, achieving his dream of being a star voyager. After the longer silence, the CEO said, All right then, we all have work to do. I could hear them all get up from their seats, so I ran into the nearest office. What about the press? Ethan said. What if they get wind of this? His tone was sort of empty now. They won't, the CEO said. And besides, the media loves me. The CEO clapped Ethan on the back. Fifteen minutes later, I began to clean other offices. When I finished up, I pushed the trash can and the cart up the hall. A few people from Mission Control walked past me, including the lead engineer. When he had passed me, his face was pale and his shoulders were slouched. Right after that, he told me to stop. I could tell by his voice that Ethan was the lead engineer. I froze with fear. There were rumors that security had special rooms where they dealt with people who might be stealing company secrets. I was sweating bullets as Ethan came back to face me. Once we were face to face, he raised his hand and threw a disposable coffee cup into my trash can. Then he walked away without saying another word. Still, frozen in place, I thanked my lucky stars he didn't confront me. A short while later, it was the end of shift. I went to the drive through to get a late dinner, but was just going through the motions. The smell of the food actually started to revolt me, so I threw it into the dumpster behind the place. After that, I drove out to the middle of nowhere. When I found a nice spot, I pulled over. I looked up at the sky and marveled at all the stars there, but then something came over me. I thought of Whisper and her captain, floating up there with a the gentle glow coming from the engines. The captain was going to die. Maybe it would be thirst or starvation. Maybe he'd run out of air. Or maybe that purple cloud was going to get him too. I'm recording this because I had to get it off my chest. There's still a possibility the other shoe will drop. My life may be in danger, but I just don't know yet. If I'm lucky, I'll be as invisible as I have been every other day of my life. And at least I can communicate with you. I have the ability to share my story through this recording. Nobody is taking the captain's calls now. He may not have known his life was in danger, but he will soon. Floating up there all alone, just waiting to die on the whims of some monster. And that's the thing. Sometimes monsters are a purple cloud floating in the dark of night, and sometimes they send men to their deaths in the pursuit of greatness. <laughs>